Forbes magazine calls him one of the most listened to recording artists of our time, with more than 3 billion streams and 11 number one albums on top Billboard charts. This is All Heart with Paul Cardall. Welcome to season five of All Heart. I'm your host, Paul Cardall. If you're tuning in for the first time, this podcast is an opportunity to hear from people I admire. We get to the heart of why they do what they do in hopes of inspiring and encouraging you to fine tune the gifts God has also given you. Cause you took my scars, bruises and guest today is Peter Cater. He is no stranger to the music industry. In fact, he's got 14 Grammy nominations with two wins. He's in the category of New Age. I'm very excited to welcome him to All Heart. We're going to get into the history of New Age music, his career, and where it is going. Welcome to All Heart with Paul Cardall. Yeah. Is this a good like fill in terms of my face yeah. size in the whole screen? Is this good? Yeah, man. Balance for you. Young and hip, dude. You look- okay, that's the most important thing. We can talk about music all you want, but let's talk about how young I look now. <laughs> you got me interested. <laughs> you know, I want to talk about this unique genre because it used to be so popular. It still is popular, but the commercial world doesn't seem to recognize <laughs> it. People like you and I have had to carve out our own little niche within the niche of new age music. So you came over with your family. Why did your parents move from Germany over to the, the United States? Honestly, uh, post-World War II, land of opportunity, wanted to get away from, you know, everything and their parents included and wanted to start over in a place that felt like they had a potential for a better life, I guess. I mean, I think that's why. Yeah. Did your parents, were they musical? No, but my great-grandparents were that's the, that's the early music I can find, earliest music I can find in my family is my great grandparents on my mother's side. Yeah, that's a lot like me. There's nobody in my family. I mean, people took piano lessons in my family, but nobody really, other than a great grandfather that could just sit and play. And he used to create thunderstorms on the piano. And my, my, dad, my dad would say that that's about as much music as we got. And, uh-huh. Yeah, so there's a lot of similarity there. So, but you started taking piano lessons when you were over here, and and you started doing classical music. Yeah, I didn't like it. It was my mom's idea. Ten years of classical piano, and then finally she found me a teacher who could teach me how to play the pop and rock music that I wanted to play, and taught me how to improvise. And that's when it started getting interesting. And that's when I started writing my own stuff and improvising. What were the bands that you were heavy into? For my, I mean, I played everything because I had to play the music my parents liked as well. So I played all the, you know, Frank Sinatra stuff and, you know, Tony Bennett stuff, whatever. And George Gershwin and all that. For me, it was like, oh, Stairway to Heaven, you know, Led Zeppelin and Elton John and Billy Joel and Carol King and James Taylor and Cat Stevens, Eagles, just on and on, all those classic 70s bands. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm right with you. Was it easy to play that stuff compared to Gershwin? I found it easy, you know? And I guess it's, I don't know. I I, I always found it all kind of easy. Uh, but then I started to enjoy it, and that was a whole other dimension. And were you were you playing in bands? Were you doing so? Yeah. yeah, I was a teenager playing in bands, playing for the dances, for the proms. Uh, drinking age in New Jersey was 18. So I managed to start playing clubs when I was 16, you know, sneaking in the back door, you know, with bands and, you know, it was whatever, you know, it was a way to go through. I mean, and it still is, it's a gifted way to go through life in general, but just looking back on, you know, just the cool things I got to do starting at a pretty early age, you know, pretty awesome. Yeah. Anytime you get to, I remember 16 sneaking out to just go to this club under the viaduct and I saw a band called Pearl Jam. This was 1989. (laughs) And then, you know, that's the one story. It's like, yeah, I saw Pearl Jam before Pearl Jam. (laughs) But uh, uh, those are the, the, I love that because then music had such an impact on me. And so when you started diverting from that, what was your 
mom's response since she wanted you doing the class yeah she, she didn't like it um and also they never really she never intended for me to take it that seriously she was more like play the piano and be popular at parties you know that kind of thing but when i started really getting into it and started on my own accord playing the music that i liked hours a day banging away at our little house yeah. lower middle class you know probably thousand square foot house in new jersey it was she was like would you stop you know would you stop especially stop playing that song would you just stop you know and um maybe in some ways that fueled my fire even more yeah. um, you know sorry to say she passed away when i turned 18 and she never really got to see how much of an impact she really had on my life by making me do that sorry about that so how much has your relationship with your parents influenced some of that early writing of music well to be transparent you know my upbringing with my parents was not fun. They were very young parents. They weren't really equipped. My mother got divorced when I was you know, like four, married a guy who was abusive and alcoholic. My, my upbringing was extremely traumatic and stressful. Music yeah. for me was my escape, my place to go. And yes, yeah, so it totally informed everything that I had played and everything that I wrote, you know, because I was looking for, I was looking for help, you know? Yeah. And, and, Having music literally saved my life. You know, I, I can't imagine what I would have done to cope had I had not that that crutch and that passion. You know, yeah, pretty interesting. And clearly, the the music you're doing and the music you've done for years, the all the Grammy nominated and the two Grammy wins, that's music that has been helping people process, drop process life. Tell me about it. I mean. I just get the greatest emails from people, you know, that are so moving and so gratifying, you know, like it's a gift, you know, yeah, it's a gift to be able to do something that you love and need so much. And then to get the feedback that it's being received on such a deep level with, you know, a fair amount of people. It's beautiful. And every day, like I said, every day I'll get some email or some message from somebody that's like, wow, thank you. I know. How old were you when you first started getting something like that, that kind of reaction to your music? I would say I was in my early 20s. Early 20s. Yeah. It's powerful stuff. Thank you. Thanks for acknowledging that. I mean, again, I, I, I mean, I take credit for it in that I showed up for it. You know, I take credit in that I'm on board for the ride. But I'm sure you can agree with me that it's a miracle that it can happen at all and that it's coming through you or me and that we can be, you know, I mean, not to be too cliche, but a, a vessel, you know, to for a message, you know, and that's amazingly beautiful and amazingly humbling. You know, I, go, I always go back to the film Amadeus, even though that was not an accurate portrayal of Mozart. Uh, I always go back to that film where Salieri is so pissed off. He's so angry <laughs> at God because he looks over and sees this person who's receiving the divine music, <laughs> changing the world. And he's like, I'm the one that's committed. Why can't I get that gift? And I, I sometimes feel like that. I don't know if you ever feel like that. Like, wow, I can't believe like I'm a wreck. I don't know. You know, at times I'm a wreck and I, I need to play the piano in order to process my own challenges and then oh. it's almost as though there's such a connection with everybody it's such a community the world uh it, it is yeah. a small world um yeah yeah very it's small world. world you know i was having a conversation this morning with someone that kind of happened spontaneously and this was a kind of a new person that works at this cafe and she's like oh yeah so you're a musician you're a piano player I'm like yeah she goes what other hobbies do you have what other, you know, do you have any other creative outlet or expression? And it's funny, I thought, uh, I, I, she caught me off guard and I was like, uh, no, no, I guess that's it. A few minutes later, I realized that my, my true obsession, my, my true thing, actually, music is actually secondary. Music for me is an expression of my true passion. And my true passion is knowing myself and my spiritual path. Self-inquiry, you know, connection to God, to the universe, you know, that's, that's my path. Music is a way that I, like you just said, process, express, uh, it's like an autobiography. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, 
And I'm sure you can relate because, I mean, I've known you for like a week, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I've listened to your music, you know, and I'm like, I know, I know that Paul knows exactly where I'm coming from because yeah. I, I hear it in your work. Thank you. You know, thank you. And uh, so it's, I was looking forward to talking with you because honestly, it's rare that I get to talk to another musician, especially a piano player. Yeah. Who I respect and, you know, genuine, genuinely like, you know, sure. the only other person I would want to talk to honestly would be Keith Jarrett and I'd be intimidated to death to talk to him. <laughs> so I would never do it. <laughs> there are a lot of artists where I'm like, I don't know what I would say. And it's not so much you're talking to them, you're talking to their body of work. You know, that's what you're just so nervous about. And there was one artist who's written some lyrical pieces that I really loved. And I finally got a chance to meet him. And my wife was like, you couldn't even talk to the guy. What's, what's your problem? I'm like, I don't think you understand the body of work that came through this person. Right. And she's like, talk to the person. Don't talk to the body of work. <laughs> but I'm, I'm totally with you. But because the music that we do, the, the genre that we're in, um, you know, it's been categorized as new age. Why is it called new age? Cause I, I tap into Christian, I tap into all kinds of styles. I've done some country music. You know, you've done some diverse stuff, some jazz, some some other elements. And so there's this new age category that came about, I think it was shortly after the, uh, the 60s. It was, uh, and please correct me, I believe it was Will Ackerman that was the first to really get a commercial ball rolling with the genre, him and George Winston out of Berkeley. The music was being played and a lot of things happened mm. out of Berkeley and out of that whole world. Um, what, what can you share as far as like this unique genre that came out of nowhere? Because it's I, much like classical music formatted, like a pop song. I can actually, I can actually share a lot about this and I'm glad you asked me because this is a very, first of all, it's a question that everyone has like new age. Why is it called that? And where did it come from? So I was there at the beginning, dating myself, right? I was there at the beginning of it. And I'll, I'll tell you where it really came from. It came originally, the plant of the seed for this were people like Paul Winter, the, the group Oregon, Ralph Towner, Paul McCandless, uh, artists like uh, um, Eberhard Weber, German bass player, uh, Vangelis, Kitaro. These were all people that were playing this kind of music before it had a name. Keith Jarrett, even, his Colm concert, as much as he would hate for me to say this, and I'm sure he's not, I'm sure he's heard it before, his Colm concert album was huge for what is this music that is not classical, it's not jazz, it's clearly emotive, it's clearly emotional. And that influenced me, it influenced George Winston, it influenced William Ackerman, um, you know, all the people that you would consider, Enya, Enya probably was, I don't know when she came in. I think she came in after New Age was already a genre. Yeah. But, but there was clearly this need for musical that was not classical, not jazz, moving, spacious, reflective. And why they called it New Age, man, I don't know. I kind of feel like that was one of the biggest bummers of the whole thing. You know, no one's ever liked that term. No, I don't know. I don't know why it happened. Um, and it's been a point of discussion ever since we recently, because I've been involved with the Grammys. You know, we just recently over the last few years, it's been a big debate again. Do we really need a new age category? That's just new age. Why can't we call it ambient? Why can't we call it other things? Right. And just this year, you know, they pushed through this thing to change it to new age ambient or chant, which I think is whatever um that's worse I, I i love all that music i mean i get more chart action on ambient charts than i do new age charts these days but you know like you said it's all kind of you know vague and it's not as popular as it used to be because i think it's evolving it's evolving but people aren't evolving necessarily with it you know and even for myself you know, like you know I don't like calling myself a new age artist. I prefer to be thought of as a contemporary pianist. I'm drawing on all kinds of musical genres and styles that I love. I'm drawing on my life experience and I'm kind of filtering it through my palette of colors and textures and, and out, out it comes, you know, it's, it's a hybrid of 
whatever. It's, yeah, I mean, it's been fascinating because when I first started at age 16, 17, just playing the piano by ear, it was because I had heard Christopher's Dream, David Lantz, on a, on a record. The girl I was dating had this album. Her brother was playing the piano. He was doing all the arpeggio in the left hand, um, you know, playing Chip Davis, Mannheim Steamroller, Fresh Air stuff. And then, and I hadn't even heard of Enya at the time. And then I started looking for other pianists. Ray Lynch was really popular. George Winston, of course, was selling a, a ton. And there was, there seemed to be two labels that kind of dominated uh, Wyndham Hill and Narada. And then there was another yeah. one called Higher Octave. And uh, yeah. I ended up signing with uh, Narada, but it was at a time where <laughs> their accountant had embezzled from the company and they needed to sell and it was unfortunate for that company but they ended up you know they sold to virgin that then was bought by capital then you had the napster thing it was just all kind of like this crumble of of those two big labels and but i kept watching you because you seem to remain steadfast plowing ahead your own path at least that's what those of us on the outside observed. So walk us through that, that time period of when you had these two big labels and you're just kind of like, you're charting, you're, you're getting nominated for Grammys. And, you know, meanwhile, my colleagues like Jim Brickman and David, Lund, they're not, you know, it's like, you're just kind of leading the back, like whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for that reflection. Uh, it's nice to be seen that way. Um, and it's interesting. I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause again, I was there, you know, John Maury started, uh, the Narada label when I was in 1982, I had a private investor say, you know, I want to, I want, I want to pay for you to make an album. So I made an album. It was my first album called spirit. Yeah. Uh, I shopped the album. I got record offers from Narada, from Chip Davis, American gramophone, uh, blue note. I think I had like several label offers. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. You know, I was kind of like, I was not really thinking that what I did was really that interesting or special. I just knew it was what I did, you know? Yeah. But then they're like, we'll pay you 75 cents a record. I'm like, but wait a minute, wait a minute. You're selling the record for $15, $15 and you're going to pay me 75 cents. Oh, plus, plus half your publishing. That's another, you know, 25 cents or whatever. Right. I'm like, oh, so I'm making, I'm making a dollar a record. And you're making whatever, you know, after you know, manufacturing, whatever, you're making six or seven dollars an album off of my album. Yeah. You know, I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> so I talked to my investor guy. I was like, you know, I, I want to start my own small label. I want to distribute my own albums. And back in that day, you could actually do that because there was record stores. There was retail promoters you could hire. There was radio promoters you could hire. If you had a good album with at least a couple of good songs on it, if you could get distribution, and if you hired the best radio person and the best retail person and a decent publicist, it would work out. You know what I mean? You'd, you'd get radio airplay because there really were radio stations. And you'd get sales and you'd put your stuff on, you know, end caps and on display on sale. And, you know, you'd make deals like, well, we'll discount the record. We'll send you 3,000 units. You know, you put it on end cap, you'll make more money on it and I'll sell more quantity, blah, blah, blah. There was a method behind the madness back then. I there that. isn't anymore. It's just madness now. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's changed so much, so dramatically. And you're speaking my language because I went through that exact, exact same scenario, you know, uh, with, with, with uh, Narada wanted an album that I had, which was accompanying uh, to a New York Times bestseller called The Christmas Box. And it was a movie that had been seen by 40 million people on CBS. And so I had the music and uh, they wanted it. And so, you know, we sold it with an album deal, but then I was able to get out quick, but I already had because the labels own the distribution companies. I already had a set in deal with the distribution company so I could go start my own label and do the same thing you're talking about, send stuff. But at the beginning, it's like nobody wants the product. So we do it on consignment. We go in the media place, the big stores. I set up my keyboard. I sell on consignment. They get enough people buying stuff that then they're able to put it on the shelf. And 
you know, and then you pitch to the the radio stations that are playing at the smooth jazz, the mostly, I think it was college radio and some classical uh, stations and NPR st- stations that were playing the music. Yeah, they used to be called contemporary jazz. That was the genre. And the smooth yeah. jazz came later. Yeah, that's when I would, they wanted me to do a smooth jazz record. I was like, I can't do, I'm not Dave Cos. I can't do that stuff. I, this is what I do. And so I, I'm with you. It's changed so dramatically. So it has changed, changed so dramatically. And there was a lot of stuff. I mean, I'll tell you a little personal story. And I know I were, well, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So Narada wanted the album, right? And I w- didn't give it to him because I just thought they were just cheap as hell. I was insulted by their offer. And so I, proceeded to do my own distribution, release the record myself. I was listening to the radio in LA just before my record was about to come out. And I heard a song come on. I think it was on the wave. It, I, it was like my song. It's, it was my song. The whole beginning of it was my song. And I was thinking, how did they get my record already? Mm. And, and then it veered off into this other direction after a little while. And it was David Lanz. What happened was, is John Morey liked my album, played that song for David Lund, said, do, do something like this. Mm. They pushed it out in a hurry, released it before my album. The album Heart Sounds from David. That's I, I think you're, you're, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah, and there's, there's a song on there that, and I talked to David, David and I are friends. I talked to him about <laughs> it years ago. I was like, you know, you stole that song from me. <laughs> <laughs> and and he didn't he denied it you know can't say i blame him <laughs> he was high uh, <laughs> he was high at the time but it's water under the bridge i mean it's great great flattery actually yeah. i mean uh, you know they, they say there's nothing more flattering than you know having someone copy your style or your work you know oh absolutely and you kind of forged out a sound that we all we're looking at and you know between you and george winston and so many others and the other thing you were doing that i thought was fascinating was your artwork on your album covers i can't remember the name of the album but it was the one that came out in 1990 90 migration it had four different images hooded hooded figures yeah there we go i saw that because i'm you know every time i was trying to design my own artwork i was looking at everybody else's not trying to copy but at least trying to get awareness of the people that were actually pulling it off and you were pulling it off so i'd look you were one that i referenced quite a bit for some of the earlier album code yeah. i was a one-man band doing doing everything uh, i hear you i hear you <laughs> and there's so much joy in it but at the same time there's frustration right because you need help yeah and no one does it as good as you do that's right <laughs> no one no one does it the way you want the first time yeah yeah, it's tough uh, delineating or whatever it's called uh, your your career, your your image. You know, yeah. you're giving giving responsibility to other people to brand you. It, that's a tough one. Well, and in this genre, there are no managers, there are no agents. You are the manager. You are the agent. You're booking your own shows, or you're trying to create a show that hires an agent. And it's a it's a it's an interesting phenomenon because you're streaming. You know, I'm sure you locked onto Pandora Radio and the streaming numbers are through the roof compared to a lot of commercial acts that can go out and sell an arena, but they don't have the sales that an instrumentalist has. It's a fascinating conundrum. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I'm just venting some of the frustrations over the years because, uh, you know, you understand what, you know, what I've not been able to pull off. I've had, you know, I've had, and it's not so much about getting at the top of the charts or anything like that or getting awards, but, but that is nice to have the recognition of all the hard work that you've put in because you know people are responding to the music in such an emotional and powerful way that if you can get a little bit of recognition, hopefully you can reach even more people so they have those same uh, That's exactly right. supernatural experiences with the music. That's exactly. It's a tool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Winning an award is like a tool for just being able to reach more people. You yeah. Know? The, the, the award itself is, I think, relatively insignificant in terms of how it really impacts your life personally yeah but but to say that you're a you know an award-winning grammy-winning whatever artist 
people are a little more interested. They are, you know, especially when you say that you're, you're a piano player. Well, what what do you sing? I don't know. I'm a piano. I play the piano. My music is uh, contemporary. I say the same thing: contemporary instrumental. And uh, they're they're like, oh, how do you get those numbers? And I said because people are having these powerful experiences and it's out of my hands. I have no control over it. I just try to put the music out there and the divine takes over. I concur. You concur. You're and, and you do, and you, and you do it very well. I I've looked at your numbers. They're impressive. You know, congratulations on reaching so many people. I've got, I've got good fans. I've got good people. And you know, you, you stick with a niche. I grew up in Utah, so we had a very religious community there and, I grew up in the Latter-day Saint community, and so I would play the songs that I knew growing up, and that's what I would put onto albums. I just play what my heart is telling me to play, and it started to resonate. But it, it's it been cool because now we've got a, a Muslim brotherhood out in New Delhi at a university where they, they volunteered to run my fan club in India. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, it's like to go from one end to the other it's it's amazing but i want to talk about your first grammy award nomination which was for red moon 2003 so what was that process back then <laughs> I, I wasn't even on my radar actually no really? you know, i wasn't yeah i was just i remember when i got the phone call i was driving in my car on the way to a gig and I got a phone call from my friend who was also the uh, head of a label that I was with at the time called Silverwave Records. And my friend James Marienthal called me and he said, I want to be the first to congratulate you on your Grammy nomination. And I was like, what? I just couldn't believe it, really. Because, again, I, wasn't, I didn't even know it was like voting time or nominations yeah. were coming out or anything. Yeah. And I, I literally, I, I can say I went through the roof in terms of excitement. It was like, you know, it was a big acknowledgement of like, wow, people are paying attention. You know, that's kind of cool. And that was the beginning of that whole ride of, you know, pretty much almost every year getting nominated. It became more of a conscious thing, becoming more aware of the process of voting and the whole nominations process, getting somewhat involved with NARIS in terms of some of the committees. But I didn't win for my first. I got 12 nominations pretty much in a row where I did not win. Wow. And then I'm on my 13th, my third, and I was beginning to think, what's the problem? On my 13th nomination for an album that I improvised and was just me solo piano, just improvising. Yeah. Actually, they're, they're piano readings. They're individual piano readings that I do. I get people to lie under the piano and I talk to them first and then I get like a download of like key signatures, chord changes, melodies. And I improvise for them and record it, and I give it to them. I call them piano readings. Wow. And so this, my first Grammy win was an album called Dancing on Water, which was a collection of some of my favorite piano readings that I had recorded for people, all improvised. And that was a huge acknowledgement because I had done many albums with lots of production value, lots of great guest artists, you know, orchestra, you know, cost tons of money to make, all that kind of stuff. So my first win was just me improvising on the piano, which to me was like a message of like, you know, just keep it simple. Yeah. You know, just like, just be yourself, you know, don't try so hard, you know, just be natural and let it flow. That was the message I got from that. You're so right. I think often we fight that because we want to kind of get out of that comfort zone and and expand. Uh -huh. my wife is always saying stick to what you know stick to what you know St you know she worked on wall street she's very black and white you play the piano well you know i produced a song with a grammy winning country artist you know uh thompson square and it's like this oh, i'm excited about this and it's a great song and i love the project and you know, a lot of money went into it but it was like stick to what you know they, they want to hear you play the piano yeah. And it's funny because, you know, we often come from this question of like, am I good enough? Yeah. You know, am I, am, am I, do I have enough to say and offer? Is, is my, is my offering valid enough just to stand on its own or do I need to add to it to kind of give it more, more value? And uh, that comes from, you know, our own inner, 
insecurities, you know, or on the, the hole that we have of, of self-worth, you know, it's nice to get an affirmation of like, yeah, I am enough. Yeah. It's amazing. It is amazing. It's a very rewarding uh, style of music. It's very spiritual. People have many different beliefs and, you know, obviously when we said new age, that gives a connotation out to everybody, but what it is, but to me, it's just a spiritual style of music. It, it, it helps people access I think it's, I think it comes down to our bodies made up of a certain amount of water. There's a vibration that takes place with that type of music. It's brain frequencies. It's the way the dopamine is released. We know now it's, it's the beats per minute. It's all of those elements to release the dopamine. That's so soothing and satisfying. And, um, what's fascinating to me, and I don't know if this is to you, but now we're seeing this everywhere. The type of music we, we do, it's now like, dominating the calm apps and and in a world that is it becomes so fast and now the music that we created for years is becoming so popular for example spotify you probably aware of this created the fake artists uh, accounts of pianos piano players it was a swedish company uh, that just created stock music and then they threw some names and so when you have your your instrumental piano playlist, you don't even have <laughs> people like you or me or the artists that have been, you know, that have people know. And then, yeah. yeah, it's so it's it's oh, they don't have to pay royalties. The audience doesn't know that, but we know that <laughs> they don't. Yeah, have that was that was surprising. I didn't see that coming. I remember going on Spotify and you know and just kind of cruising around to see what's out there, and I'm like, well, I never heard of this guy. Never heard of him either. Well, wow, that's not bad. I never heard of him. <laughs> it just kept on going. And then I kind of got the inside scoop of like, oh, okay. Yeah. But somewhere there's there's somebody playing that song. And uh, and I'm sure, listener, that you're probably confused by a lot of this dialogue. But this is the world that Peter and I are in. And uh, the music business, uh, I've, I find a lot of joy in it. Have you found pleasure in in doing the the business aspect of it? I've always loved it. Yeah, I've always, like you said, been my own manager. You know, I've I've learned over the years to read legal contracts and negotiate deals, and uh, I like it. I'm I'm proud of the fact that I came from a world where if you wanted to make an edit, you know, on a track, you needed to pull out your razor blade and your scotch tape, you know, and cut that tape. And then and then and then tape it back together with your scotch tape. You know, that's two inch tape. That's where we started and, and went from, you know, selling cassettes and LPs to CDs to MP3s to streaming to who knows what's next. I have no idea. It's been a long ride of metamorphosis. I don't know, like just evolving, you know, just always changing with whatever's next and uh, learning the the latest everything from digital editing, you know. And mixing to uh, traversing the world of of uh, streaming and Spotify, and Amazon, and yeah, I, I enjoy it. But, but it's easier to say also because you know, I, I've been somewhat successful as well. You know, I could easily see someone going, "It sucks." You know, I'm sick of this business. <laughs> you know, I'm not getting any traction. But that's not been my experience. But but I'm also not doing it for. I'm very clear that my motivation is for the joy and the privilege of creating music. Sure, I watch chart numbers and I I notice sales and I you know pay attention to that kind of stuff. But I never write music with the intention of wow, this is going to get billions of millions of streams. You know, oh, this song is going to be really popular. Right. You know, I never I never do that. And maybe the few times that I've tried to do that it didn't really work out that well. You know, it's always, I, I, ne I never know which songs are going to be the most popular. I, I always like to say that the, the best things in my life I never saw coming. This idea that we know what is good for us or what we need or what's really going to help us grow the most. I don't know. I, I, my path musically and in my personal life was one of surrender. You know, I just want to just be innocently doing my art and going through the world and being open to where I'm led and what happens next. I'm totally with you. Your latest album, you've got so many albums. <laughs> Your latest album is Soul Story. 
How is that different from any of your other projects? It's another collection of uh, these piano readings that I was telling you about, because uh, I have so many of them. I've done hundreds and hundreds of them. And some of the stuff that comes through, is, I think, is pretty good. And so I wanted to do another collection uh, of uh, some of my favorite passages. Uh, actually, I have another album, but it's completely different. It's, it's a collection of my collaborations with Native American artists. Oh, wow. I've worked with a lot of Native American artists, and uh, a lot of the songs and albums you know, were very uh, sort of behind the scenes. Some of them were never given digital distribution, so they kind of didn't get a lot of a notice and attention. So I put a compilation together, which I think is actually very, very cool. It's called Native America, and it's totally different than the Soul Story thing. Yeah. It's more produced, lots of guest artists, yeah. percussion, strings, lots of people. You're producing that. Yeah, I produce everything I do. Love it. Love it. And then and I and I engineer and mix everything I do. do I you? love the mixing. The mixing process is my favorite process. Are you using Pro Tools or are you in Logic now? No. I'm using Digital Performer. Digital Performer. That's a pretty solid uh a little complicated. Well, when I was diving into the digital world, you know, I had to choose between um Pro Tools and Digital Performer and more of my friends that were, you know, working, uh, had digital performer. So I could lean more on them for the learning curve and advice and help and stuff. So wow. that's the direction I went. Ultimately, I don't really think it really, any of it really makes much of a difference. You're getting pretty much the same tools and the same quality right. on all these platforms, you know. It's just a matter of um, which, which software do you understand, which software are you willing to understand? You know, it's, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> there's years and years of, this process of being in this industry where it's like, you know, I need a website. I got to pay a guy. I'm going to learn Dreamweaver, you know, Dreamweaver. I'm going to learn uh, the Adobe. I'm going to learn this and that. And I think a lot of artists in our category, the world that we're in do this, we're, we're kind of, I don't want to say it's a home business, but it's uh it's kind of like, it's all of it's we're like, you know, I think of Mary Poppins. You remember Bert at the very beginning of the show, he's got every single instrument tied to him. And he's doing a little performance right before. <laughs> you know that? In, uh, I do. I do, actually. Now that you mentioned it, it was Dick Van Dyke, right? Yeah, Dick Dick Van Dyke as Bert. Uh, he's playing every single instrument. And it seems to me that kind of is our our world. We're, we're like that, where we're trying to... We wear all the hats. We've had to learn how to wear all the hats. We enjoy yeah. all the hats, you know? We, yeah, we do. We do. Every day, I kind of like, well, what am I in the mood for? Am I in the mood for mixing? Writing? uh social networking you know yeah. sending out an email blast negotiating some deal or something it's like we get to jump around and be like who am i today am i the moody artist or am i the businessman that's right that's right but we need the mood to get to those uh, moments in order to pull out the light <laughs> i love it well, every, everybody, uh, go check out Peter Cater's music. If you're not familiar with it, I do not know where you have been. Uh, he is he is a giant uh, legend in this genre. And it's an, it's an honor for me to talk with you. And I hope we can keep in touch. And Thank you. Can I say one more thing? Can I say one more thing or ask you one more thing? Sure. We talked or, earlier on, we asked, we talked about the origins of New Age music. Are you familiar with uh, Paul Winter and the group Oregon? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, oh. you are okay because those are those are my heroes. Those for me are the giants. You know, yeah. my good friend Paul McCandless, who is the oboe sax player for Oregon and for Paul Winter. You know, he, his name recognition isn't anything like mine or yours. His Spotify is nothing like ours is. Yeah, and yet you know he's he's a master. These people are masters. You know, they're giants like in my world of of music. And oh man, it's just. I just feel so good to acknowledge your heroes. Oh, yeah. Paul Winter. There was a time where I worked for a distribution company and I was distributing the music, you know, that I was doing. And I would try to, to bring in like your music and, and Paul Winter's music into these bookstores that I was responsible for. And so I was always sifting through looking for stuff. And even when you're thinking, ah, oh, maybe I need a label. You're looking at all these artists and trying to figure out what's their business model. How are they able to to successfully do this? Some get grants, some just have investors and others are just using the resource they got from the last record. But yeah, Paul Winter, yeah, mind-blowing. You know, there were people like Ray Lynch who yeah. 
you know, set out unique. Uh, what, was, what was it? Breakfast? Uh, what was breakfast. it? Uh, deep breakfast. Yeah. With him, yeah. it was all the dance. Every high school dancers, like their dance program, everyone was doing deep breakfast. So uh-huh. everybody would like, what is this song? You couldn't Shazam it back then. Right. You know, so people would go down to the record store to Sam Goody or Media Play and look for it in the very small new age section. It's such an interesting, and there's really no, I mean, I, I feel like there ought to be some type of museum to new age music and the history of it because it's such a unique part of American history. Yeah. It's and it's actually popular in uh, foreign markets in a huge way. You know, in, in Japan, they actually call it healing music, uh, which I think is great that they can actually come out and just say it, you know, healing music. You know, it's like it's respected, I think, more in some other foreign markets as a, they, they see it more for what it really is, which I think is, you know, healing work. Or, yeah. I mean, I, I tend to avoid using words like that to describe what I do because that gets into sticky areas, you know, but, uh, is that why our commercial markets always avoided that basically saying what it is because healing could mean anything to anybody. What would the challenge I've seen is that you've, you, when you lock a religion to a certain genre and it seems that the new age, I remember going to a new age convention and being told I don't belong there because I had been outspoken about my Christian faith. And I was kind of confused because I, this is all about healing and uh, you have a source. I have a source, you know, as long as we have a source, it's very healing. Yeah. We're always shaking our heads on this, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> and we just do what we do. Yeah. That's the thing. We just do what we do. And then yeah. like, everyone else kind of jumps around and has to figure it out and decide what box to put it in. Well, what do you do when you're not? Well, you already answered this, not hobbies, but what are you doing when you're not? doing music you, you live in hawaii are you are you surfing are you scuba diving are you looking for whales yeah i have a big passion of mine is is looking for whales on my paddleboard during whale season really mostly in hawaii i just i don't know i just it feels like my sweet spot that thing you know aloha is a real thing you know people think that aloha means like hello goodbye you know whatever but aloha is a spiritual energy it's it's the word actually it means more like namaste you know, aloha refers to the breath and how we all share the same breath. We are connected to each other by our breath. And that's what aloha is. And uh, I feel it here all the time. There's connection. You know, I walk out, I, li- I live in Waikiki right now. I used to live on Maui, which was, you know, I was all about finding deserted beaches and being alone in nature. I finally had enough of that. And uh, now I'm in Waikiki and I walk out my front door and within you know, a couple of minutes, I see people from seven different continents and countries and colors and, and everyone is connecting and interweaving in some way. And I find it really beautiful. Just really, I mean, sitting, I mean, I have the luxury of having hours a day to reflect and not just, not just be in meditation because actually I, I don't do as much as that as I used to, but just to reflect on my world. It's like, you know, am I breathing? Am I breathing deeply? What are my thoughts doing? How do I feel? You know, where am I in my body? Uh, you know, am I, am I feeling connected to source? You know, and I get to process through stuff that's in the way of me being fully present with myself and with life. And uh, that's my main passion. I love it. Hawaii is amazing. Well, thank you, Peter, for being on All Heart. And uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, let's keep in touch. Cause you took my scars, bruises, and Number one, Billboard pianist Paul Cardall. Do you believe in miracles and second chances? Over a decade ago, I was raised from the dead. Read Paul's story, The Broken Miracle, by J.D. Netto. Visit thebrokenmiracle.com.